Song number 341, song number 341. <laughs> song number 341.
Good evening, everybody. At this time, we'll go over this week's announcements. If you have a bulletin, just open it up to the top left-hand corner there. If you don't have a bulletin, just raise your hand. Brother Segura would bring you one. Open it up to the top left-hand corner there. You have the service times listed. 10.30 a.m. was this morning service. Tonight's service is at 6.30 p.m. on Sundays. And then this Wednesday is at 7 p.m. We'll have the Bible study, and we'll be back on. Pastor Anderson will be here, and we'll do Jeremiah chapter number 27. Below that, we have the church-wide soul winning times listed, the regional soul winning times, and then as well the addition uh, with the uh, North Phoenix soul winning time if you live up in that area. We'll go ahead and we will uh, count up the soul winning for the past couple days going back to the 22nd, which would have been Thursday. Anybody have anybody saved out on the 22nd? Just one right there? All right. Anything else? Okay, what about Friday the 23rd? One here? We had a group of 17. 17, okay. And then one. All right, anything? Two there? All right. Anything else? All right, and then the 24th yesterday. Anything six for, for the group. Six for the group. Okay, what outside the group? Anything outside the group? One there? All right, anything else? All right, and then today. What about for the group today? 21. Okay, gotcha. Anybody outside of that? Okay, two. Gotcha. One there. All right, two. Okay, anything else that I'm missing? All right, perfect. Okay, down below that we have the salvations and the baptisms listed for the month of September and also for uh, the year of 2016. And then the offering totals listed below that. We have all the October birthdays over on the right-hand side that are listed. And then, you know, remember to please join us for the donuts and coffee that will be on October 2nd coming up here next week. And then uh, down below that we have the be sure to uh, wish happy anniversary to the following couples there. Myself, of course, and then the Burbanks. And then we have the Bible memory passage there, the Ecclesiastes chapter number three. So we have, you know, one more week of this. So just make sure you're staying, you're, you know, you're staying, you're kept up with this because these bigger passages, you know, if you get behind, if you miss a couple of, of verses, you know, and you still have two weeks. So you'd have plenty of time to even catch back up if you are behind. So make sure you're staying up with that. And then we have uh, the upcoming events that are listed on the back for the homeschool field trip. That's on the uh, October 6th at the Children's Museum. You have the Soul Winning Marathon. Uh, please, if, if anybody's available that day, please be, be sure to participate. We'll use any help that we can get. And then October 9th is, a ba is the baby shower. October 31st is the annual chili cook-off. And then we have the other homeschool field trip that will be in the month of November. That will be on the 4th. And that is uh, to the Pioneer a Arizona Living History Village. And then there on the 19th of November, we also have the 11th annual church picnic. And any parents that are homeschooling or they're home educating parents that have a child that's four years old and up, all you have to do is just RSVP. All of the, every one of the field trips are free. All you have to do is RSVP. Just make sure that you get, that you come to Mrs. Anderson. You don't have to pay anything. Just make sure that you tell her, you know, within time, however much time that she needs normally before the field trip comes, you know, she'll announce that you need to RSVP before then. And then down at the bottom is a real important announcement. I touched on it this morning too, is that this has kind of been an ongoing problem and, it get, and it's getting worse and worse. You know, we have tons of children here, so we have to make sure that we keep all of our kids under control. You know, the larger a family is, the more attentive they have to be to their kids running around. And one of the, there's a couple of points here that are, that, you know, that we we need to that uh, that are really important and number one is that the mother baby rooms the mother baby rooms are only for use by children ages two and up and that's only during the service so before the service and after the service there's no reason why the kids should be in there if for some reason a mother needed to take her child into the mother baby room and, or they were going to be supervised in the same way that they would have been during the service that would be fine of course but if the children are in there by themselves unsupervised before and after you know that that shouldn't be happening and then and also, uh, you know, an, uh, one of the important reasons, even for your own family, to follow by this 
is number one, or the main reason would be that the more traffic that we have of the older kids coming in and out, the more germs that are going to be in there. You know, if we just have just the babies going in and out during the services and no other kids, your kids are going to be a lot less likely to get sick. Even the older kids that would go in later, they would be a lot less likely to pick up some other germ and to carry it around. You know, also remember that the children should be closely supervised before and after the services. That's out in the auditorium. You know, the kids, you know, uh, you know, running around and everything, uh, you know, needs to stop, number one. But the, the reason why, one of the main reasons is because there's tons of pregnant women walking around. And one of the women, you know, they could be running around the corner, pushing the door open, whatever they may be, and hit a woman. And then obviously, then you're going to feel bad for the rest of your life. I mean, if something, you know, horrible like that were to happen. So you just need, everybody needs to be real careful, need to supervise their children as well as they can. And then also remember that they need to only be in the auditorium. The, the, uh, there's a couple of rooms, you know, like, uh, you know, like over here we have the storage room, we have the offices and everything back there, and then we also have the break room. The kids, and the kids need to only stay out here in the auditorium. If anybody is soul winning and they want to gr- uh, run into the break room and grab a drink real quick, there's no problem with that at all. They can go in there and get a drink, you know, if they just got back from from soul winning because that's what the drinks are for is to grab a drink real quick you know uh, if you're if you're you know you're really thirsty you got back from soul winning or if you're getting ready to go soul winning and you want to grab some drinks before you go just make sure that everybody all the that all the children are just staying in the auditoriums right in here and we're keeping a very very close eye on all of our kids that will do it for this uh, evening's announcements. Is there anybody here that's he- that? Is there anybody here that's present for the very first time? If you've never been here before, would you like to stand up and we get your name and where you're from? <coughs> Nobody. Oh, right here. Okay. Do you mind standing up? And just tell us where you're from. My name's Keith. I'm from All right. Great. Good to meet you, Keith. <laughs> Be sure to visit our, our to uh, greet our, our visitor after the service. And with that, we'll sing our next song. Please turn with me the song 52. Song number 52. <laughs> Zion's Hill.
right, at this time we'll pass the offering. If you could turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter number 4. That's Esther chapter number 4. Esther chapter number four, the Bible reads. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud voice and with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment, and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told, her it, told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to, Morde to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, we gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king and to the inner court who was not called, there was one law of his to put him to death, except son, such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with, the, with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then, thou sh then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Brother Matt Adams, could you pray for us? Yeah. All right, the part of the chapter that I want to focus on is there in verse number 15, where the Bible reads, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, Go therefore together, all, go gather the, together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, <clears throat> night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So the part of the, the chapter specifically that I want to focus on and where I derive the title of my sermon tonight is the famous words there that Esther uttered at the end of, of verse number 16, where she says, If I perish, 
I perish. And I changed the topic of my sermon. I had a subject that I wanted to preach on, but just with everything that's going on lately, I've been thinking about this more and more. You know, we're to the point in this country where if somebody wants to preach the Word of God and they want to go preach the gospel in another country, you know, they've been banned. We've been banned from three countries. Pastor Anderson has been banned from three countries now. He's not a violent person. He's never hurt a single person his entire life. It's only for the sole purpose of what he believes, of what he believes and what he preaches because he stands up for the word of God. We are moving. Everyone that's like, you know, that, that's, that has it in the back of their mind and they know that, that the new world order is coming fast and that persecution and the tribulation is, is going to be here, you know, soon. It's probably, even fa it's probably even coming faster than what you think. Right. We are moving towards the new world order at like breakneck speed. And it, is, it has sped up in the past 10 years to just like a new level. And that's what I'm going to preach about. I'm going to, we're going to do like a Bible study on martyrdom tonight. But also, I want to just exhort everyone here that you need to have the attitude that Esther had here. If I perish, I perish. She was in a dichotomy where she had to make a choice. She had to make a decision. And at first, she didn't want to do the right thing. She didn't want to stand up for what was right. And then Mordecai, you know, corrects her there. And you know what? And then she finally, she fixed the problem. And she said, you know what? If I perish, I perish. She just said, basically in her mind, I'm going to do the right thing either way. That Number one, that's, that's first things first. I'm going to make sure that I do the right thing, that I stand up for the Word of God, that I preach the Bible. I'm going to make sure that I do the right thing, number one. And whatever happens, whatever ha that's, that's what happens. If I perish, I perish. Now, you know, all the people that believe the pre-tribulation rapture and they think they're going to be transported out of here before all this happens... You know, they're, they're going to be in for a rude awakening here very shortly. And it's going to come real fast. But here's the thing. The most dangerous part about the pre-tribulation rapture is that it causes people to be complacent. It causes them to not think that there's any kind of trouble or there's any kind of persecution coming. So this is my message to you, Faithful Word Baptist Church member. This is my message to post-tribulation people that understand the truth of the Bible. You can make that same error. Just because you believe that you, you're not, you haven't fallen for the pre-tribulation rapture doesn't mean that you're prepared to make the right decision. That's the first step, obviously. But you need to make it up and make up your mind and you need to be ready that when that day comes, you know, when persecution comes, which it's very likely that it will come in your lifetime, there have been people killed all throughout history for the cause of Christ. It's very likely that it will happen again in our lifetime. You need to decide now that I'm going to say, if I perish, I perish. Amen. Now, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 1. We're going to start at the very beginning of the Bible, and we're going to look at some of the martyrs throughout the Bible. Now, Esther ended up being rescued here from you know, destruction, from being killed, from punishment, from the king. And let me say this too, she, she had already made up her mind, number one. She had made up her mind that I'm going to do what's right. But oftentimes, those that are willing to do what's right, very often in the Bible, those that are willing to do what's right and those that are willing to stand up for the Word of God, they're often delivered. God will often show them mercy. God will of, often find a way out for those people. Do you know who ends up really getting it first a lot of times? It's those that compromise their beliefs. Very often times, those that aren't really sure what they're going to do, they don't really know what situation, you know, what they're going to, what the decision that they're going to make in their situation, those are often the people that leave themselves in a situation to where they end up receiving the persecution first. They end up taking the, the, the you know, the, 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 the first spell of it. Now, look at Genesis chapter number four, verse number one, where it says, and Adam knew Eve, I'm sorry, yeah, this is right. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Verse 5, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. 
And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his des desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So notice what happens here. Cain and Abel both come to God, and they both bring an offering. You know, Cain ends up bringing, you know, the fruit of his labor, literally. He ends up bringing the fruit of his labor. And then we have Abel that brings the lamb. Abel brings the lamb that represents Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the, the symbolism that there is that Cain was trusting in his own works. And then we have Abel, you know, who was trusting in God, who was putting his faith in, in Christ. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 tells us more about that. It says... By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, excuse me, being dead, yet speaketh. And that's a good definition of what a martyr actually is. A martyr is someone that, that has died for the cause of something. They're dying for a reason. They're dying for someone. Like a martyr of Christ or a martyr for Christ would be someone that died for Christ. And right here at the end, it says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his, of his gifts. And then it says this, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. And the word martyr actually comes from a Greek word that means witness. So basically, you're standing up. What it's, what it's referring to is you're going to stand up and you're going to take a stand and you're going to be a witness for this person, no matter what. You're going to make sure that you stand up and you, and you, you know, stand for your testimony, no matter what. 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 12, tells us a little bit more why Cain slew Abel. It says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So we have, going all the way back to the beginning of time, where the wicked is killing the righteous, where the unsaved is killing the saved. Now, one thing that I want to point out, I don't have necessarily points throughout the sermon, but I'm going to hit on certain things that will keep coming up over and over again, and we'll see patterns throughout, this, throughout the sermon of all the martyrs throughout history. And one thing is this, that oftentimes persecution throughout history won't come from someone that just is like an atheist. Or it won't come from someone that just claims, you know, that they are just non-religious at all. Oftentimes, it will come from someone that actually claims a religion. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's where it comes from. When God's people are killed, they're killed by people that say, hey, we're doing God's work. You know, we're doing God's work. So that's something that will help you with your discernment going into the end times. You know, with being able to tell, you know, who, who is basically, you know, who is the wicked one like it talks about right here. Now, Matthew chapter 27 verse 17 tells us one other, one other aspect of this. When you see there when Cain and Abel both bring their, when they bring their offerings, Notice right at the moment when Cain's, when Cain's countenance falls, that's when he becomes angry, right at that moment. You know, he gets angry and he gets angry with Abel and he kills Abel in the end, showing that the reason why or the, or the reason why his countenance had fallen was because he was envious of, of Abel's offering. Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 17 says this about Jesus. Therefore, this is Pilate. It's talking about Pilate. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew, and then it says this, for envy they had delivered him unto him. Turn to Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 34. So when, when persecution comes on this planet, when the, the tribulation begins, you know, it's not going to come from the atheist. It's not going to come from someone that just doesn't claim religion at all. It's going to come from people that, are, that they claim themselves that they're doing God's service, that they are persecuting you know, us for the right reasons, that they're on the good side and that we're on the evil side. <coughs> now look at Matthew chapter number 23, because people will sometimes try to say that Abel wasn't a martyr. Matthew chapter number 23, look at verse number 34. Jesus speaks and says, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. And then he says this, speaking unto Jerusalem, unto, unto the, you know, the, the Jews at that time. Verse 35, That upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth, 
from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verse 36, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So there when Jesus is on this earth and he's talking about different martyrs that he had sent unto people, he includes Abel into that, showing that Abel is considered to be a martyr. And what is a martyr? A martyr is somebody that stands up for something or dies for a cause. And the reason why, why Abel was killed was because his offering was good, because he stood up for what was right. Just like when, when Esther, Queen Esther said, if I perish, I perish. She was doing what was right in that situation. If she would have ended up dying, she would have died at being a witness for something, like the word martyr means. Now turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 24, verse number 17. Just uh, Zacharias is mentioned here. We're going to look at Zacharias in the Old Testament. So we'll look at a few martyrs throughout the Old Testament, and then we'll make our way back to the New Testament. But you know, it's funny there that he says, you know, I, I, I like to point this out every time I read this verse, that he says that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. So that's like A to Z. It's the blood of Abel unto Zacharias. And then also another cool thing about that is that it's in chronological order. The very last person that was killed in the Old Testament was Zechariah. And I'm going I'm to talk about this here in just a minute. But a lot of people will claim that, it's, that this is not, when he says Zacharias there, that it's not the same Zechariah of the Old Testament. So you're in 2 Chronicles chapter number 24. Look at verse number 17. Verse number 17, it says, Now after the death, death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. <clears throat> now verse 20. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, ye hath also, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court in the court of the house of the Lord. And that's what people say today. Like People will be like, we, there's no way that there's any kind of conspiracy to try to come and kill you just for preaching the word of God. What does it say right there? Look in verse number 21. It says, And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. People are being killed for just preaching the word of God, for just what they believed all throughout history. This goes back all all the way into the Old Testament, goes all the way back for, from Abel, what Abel believed, all the way back to the beginning of human history. People have been dying for the cause of Christ. And don't think that something different is going to take place today because the exact same thing is going to happen. Obviously, we know from prophecy of the Bible, but people can just get this complacent mindset. Like I said, even though we know that the tribulation is going to come first and we're going to be raptured out of here, people can, can get this just this complacent mindset where they look around at the world and they think, well, I don't think it can happen that soon. You know, I don't think I'm going to be alive at that time. It is happening. It's, we are moving towards that so fast at this point. So everybody needs to be ready. Everybody needs to start, you know, being spiritually rooted in Christ and spiritually rooted. And you need to make up your mind what decision you're going to make. Now, here's the thing. Those that are saved, you're, here's, if you end up getting caught, you're not going to worship. The Bible's real clear. You're not going to worship the beast. You're going to go to heaven no matter what. But you know what's going to happen to you probably first? You're probably going to be one of the first people put to death. If you don't make your mind up now, the compromisers are always the first one caught. You have to have the mindset that if I perish, I perish. And we look at this passage again. Who do we see putting him to death? We see the religious leaders. We see that they start worshiping, that they're worshiping at groves, it says in verse 18. We see in verse number 20... When he comes, well, he's, it says that he's filled with the Spirit of God and he's preaching God's word. And then in verse number 21, it says, and they conspired against him and stoned him with stones. And then watch what it says, at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. So he was killed 
at the court of the house of the Lord. And some people will say, and this is why they think that this is a different person. Some people will say, because Jesus said that it was Zacharias, the son of Barachias. Now, Zacharias in, the old, in, in, in Hebrew is the same name as Zechariah, but they say there it says that it's the son of Barachias. And here it says that he's the son of Jehoiada. Right above that. But many times people have different names in the Bible. You know, you have Simon that was also called Cephas, who was also called Peter. So he has multiple names. Even in the Old Testament, Daniel was also, also called Belteshazzar. I believe that this is the same exact Zechariah because when Jesus talked about where he was killed, number one, chronologically it works out perfect. To where this is the last person that dies in the Old Testament, the way that Jesus is naming them off. And then number two, he said that he was killed in the court of the, of the house of the Lord in the New Testament, when he quoted it in Matthew chapter number 23, he said he was killed by the altar, which right here we see him being killed by the altar. Now, I'm going to have you turn, turn one more time to, uh, now we're going to go to the New Testament. Turn to Mark chapter number 6. Mark chapter number 6. And we'll see that, once again, nothing's going to change once we get to the New Testament. So there's no reason to think that things would be different for us while we're living today. Look at Mark chapter number 6. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 18. The Bible says, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him... And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, and when the daughter of the, of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent and an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. So over and over again, we see a pattern of different reasons why these people are put to death. And John the Baptist, keep in mind, he was the very first person recorded in the New Testament that was sent forth to preach God's word. The very first person that actually went out and was preaching God's word. Then you see in the Old Testament that Zechariah, he was sent to the temple with a message. He was sent to the temple and it said the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and he started preaching. So the entire reason why, the only reason why Zechariah was put to death was for preaching God's word. And the only reason why right here John the Baptist was put to death was for preaching God's word, was for preaching on subjects of sin, preaching on subjects where, you know, make people feel uncomfortable. Now, here's the thing as well. You know, when John the Baptist was put to death here, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> let me take a drink. <clears throat> I've been holding that in. When John the Baptist was put to death here, he wasn't put to death by the religious people. But we also have Jesus who ended up being put to death in the same case. And John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. And Jesus was 100% was put to death by the chief priests. Now, this, one, this thing right here really needs to make us, you know, uh, you know, zone in on how we live our lives and what we do for Christ and kind of examine ourselves in the sense of, you know, where am I at spiritually? Because John the Baptist is said by Jesus Christ to be the greatest man that ever lived. And if, if God, you know, sends forth someone, obviously there's exceptions to this. There's Paul who was sent out and did great work, the greatest missionary, the greatest evangelist probably that ever walked this earth. Now, his life, I believe, was spared. 
But God will not, even those that are willing, you know, to, to go, you know, to go as, as far as they will, you know, to do as much for God as they can. Even somebody who is ordained like John the Baptist to do a great work. That doesn't necessarily mean just because he had this, you know, this spirit upon him doesn't mean that God will spare your life. You know, God will also, you know, God will come in and God will intervene and he will save people from certain circumstances. But it's, 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 it's up to God's judgment. It's up to God when he sees fit. Now, if we see someone that's living for God and we see someone in the Bible over and over again who are always, you know, the greatest men of God who are being persecuted, you know, always over and over again, we should expect that the greatest men of God of our day also would be persecuted. Matthew chapter number 11, verse number 11 says this, the Jesus speaking, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So he says very plainly that John the Baptist I'll have you go ahead and turn to Acts chapter number six. He says very plainly that John the Baptist is the greatest man that has ever walked upon this planet. So if you expect to do great things for God and you expect to get out there and to do a lot of work for God and you want to do you, you want to be the, you know, the John the Baptist of your day, expect to receive a massive amount of persecution. The more you do for God, the more persecution you're probably going to receive. God can spare you and God can intervene, but just by default, throughout the Bible, the majority of the time, the men that stood up for God and they did the most for God, they received a lot more persecution. They received, and that's why Faithful Word Baptist Church receives a lot more persecution, because this church does more for God than any other church probably upon this planet. Planet. So it would be expected that we would be persecuted more than anybody else upon this planet. Now you're in Acts chapter number 6, verse number 7. Acts chapter number 6, verse number 7. This is where Stephen is, is preaching. Right after, immediately after where Stephen, whoops, where Stephen is, uh, is ordained as a deacon. Acts chapter number 6, look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So notice a pattern. When Zechariah went in to preach the word of God, it said that the Spirit of God was upon him. You know, these are great men of God that are receiving this persecution over and over and over again. So it says in verse 9, And there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So notice also another point. Over and over again, we see the same patterns. It's the religious people at that time that were persecuting the Christians, that were persecuting the saved. Verse 10, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw, looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it, as it had been the face of an angel. Now flip over to, to chapter number seven here, and we'll read verse number one right there. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken the God of glory hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Sharon. So then he goes on to preach this entire sermon. Now go to the very, let's look at verse number, let's start at verse number uh, 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, so over and over again, these men are filled with the Spirit. Right before they get killed, they're filled with the Spirit of God, it says. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now skip down. 
Look at, uh, well, yeah, we'll just go to the next verse, 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, over and over again, like I said, the, the pattern is, number one, they're being killed by the religious people over and over again. Number two, you see these men, and it's always the very great men of God, the greatest men of their time. They're filled with the Spirit of God is another pattern. And here's the thing. If you have in your mind, I want to do great things for God. If you have in your mind, I want to be a pastor and I want to, whatever area I go to, I want to, you know, I just want to change that area. I want to, you know, preach the Word of God. I want to change people's lives. I want to get a, a bunch of people saved. Then you better make up your mind right at that same time that I'm prepared to be persecuted. And if I perish, I I perish. And that goes especially to men that want to be pastors. If you're going to go out there, because it's very likely within 10, 15 years that there are going to be laws in this country that are going to say, if you say something like what we're preaching behind this pulpit, if you say something about the homos, if you say something about adultery, if you say something about whatever, there's going to be hate speech laws. And if you get up behind a pulpit and you preach that, you're really going to have to make the decision you know, is it worth going to jail? Is it worth, if I perish, I perish. It, is there even the possibility maybe that I, I could be put to death? Probably in our lifetime. I believe that the great tribulation will take place in my life. And if it doesn't take place in my life, I think that it will for sure take place in my kids' lives. So at this time, I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm prepared. And not only that, I want to make sure that my kids are prepared. And the most important thing is not stockpiling guns. It's not stockpiling, right. you know, all this material and all this food and stuff like that. The most important thing is sp stockpiling your spirituality, getting in the Word of God and being prepared. Now, here's the thing. You know, this applies to men. This applies to women, and this also applies to children that are old enough to read the Word of God, that are old enough to be saved. If you're old enough to be saved, you know, then you're old enough to be put to death. It doesn't matter what age that you are. You know, when the Bible talks about all of those, it do that doesn't exclude the children. That, you know, when it talks about, you know, everyone that is going to worship the, the beast in the in the Revelation, when it talks about everyone's going to worship the beast except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's talking about the children too at that time. Right. So we as well, we need to make sure that our kids are ready to make the decision. We need to make sure that we ourselves, that everybody in our household, because this is coming very, very fast. And if you want to be a great man for God, even if you're going to say, I'm staying here in this area, then you better be ready to make the decision when it comes because it's coming fast. You better be ready to stand up for God and to, and to say, like Esther said, if I perish, I perish. Now turn to Revelation chapter number 6. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 6. <clears throat> like I said, the persecution always comes from the religious. And it says right here, those that claim some sort of religion, it's always a false religion. Even when the Catholics persecuted the true Christians, all the way back, every part of history, when the persecution came upon God's people, it was always people that claimed to be doing God's work. It says this in John, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 1, These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. So he's telling you, I'm telling you this so that you're not taken off guard, so that you're ready. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth, you will, th he will, think, you will think that he doeth God's service. So these people claim. So when the persecution comes, there's going to be, you know, in the end times, there's going to be a new world order religion set up as well. And this religion is going to be that you're going to be worshiping this beast. It's not the atheists that are going to be coming after you. And when I receive emails from all the people that support, you know, the homos in, in South Africa, and I receive emails through the church email of all the, just all the homos in general, even reprobates, they send emails and they're like, you don't know who God is. I'm going to tell you who God is. They don't claim to not believe in God. They, they believe in a God of their own imagination, obviously. They believe in a God, not the God of the Bible. They, they, you know, they're just like how Cain was. You know, they're of that wicked one. They're not of the God of the Bible. But they still claim to be religious. So when this comes, this persecution is going to come from people that claim to be religious. Now, you're in Revelation chapter number 6. 
I'm going to, yeah, Revelation chapter number 6, verse number 7, we'll start reading. Revelation chapter number 6, verse number 7. The Bible says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, when he had opened the fourth seal, <coughs> excuse me, I heard the voice of the, of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, like I said, all the way back to the very beginning, we see a pattern. And one of the major patterns of why people are put to death for, the word, for God, just in general, is because of their stance particularly on the word of God. Now, look what it says right here in Revelation chapter number 6, verse number 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. And then it says this, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, everything that we looked at from Genesis all the way up to the book of Matthew, all the way up to the book of uh, Mark, all the way up to the book of Acts has already taken place. This has not taken place. There will be Christians and maybe Christians in this room that this verse could apply to if this happens in our lifetime. You know, and we need to be prepared. We need to be ready spiritually over and over again. You know, we need to be, you know, uh, you know, reading the Bible. We need to be just putting it in our minds, you know, and, and strengthening just our souls and being ready for that day when it comes. Because we can already see where the word of God is being attacked specifically. We can already see where whole countries are saying, you're not allowed here. And why aren't we allowed there? Because of the word of God. There's no other reason. No one's harmed anyone. There is no other reason at all, only because we believe the Bible. That is the only reason. Now, we need to be ready. Do you, you know, obviously, everybody in this room, I would hope, believes the Word of God. But you need to make up your mind and say, if I'm alive when that day comes, I'm going to make sure that I make the right decision. I'm going to make sure that I say, if I perish, I perish, just like Queen Esther said. We need to make sure that we're reading our Bibles. We need to make sure that we're staying in prayer. And, and also, if there are going to be people, that would be a glorious day when Christ comes back and to be still present and still alive on this earth. And if you want to be one of those people, the compromisers aren't going to make it. Let me tell you that right now. So if you have in your mind, you know, you're not really sure whether you, you have it in you or not, whether you're going to be able to make it through that whole thing, you're probably not going to make it. But if you have in your mind and you're, and you're ready and you say, hey, if I perish, I perish, those are going to be the people that get to say, that, get to, that, are, that are going to be standing there and they look up and their redemp redemption draweth nigh. Now, when the persecution comes, it's going to be coming because your stand, because of your stance on the word of God. It shows the power of God's word. Therefore, we need to spend as much time as we can just reading the Bible. And this is where we're going to get our strength for, from. This is what's going to be able to help us get through times like that. Because there could be a time upon this planet, and maybe not too long off, when they take your Bible from you. So you need to make sure that we're also memorizing God's Word. That you're hiding God's Word in your heart. And that you're ready for this time when it comes. Let's bow our heads and have a word, of, uh, quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your Word. And we thank you that you gave it to us and that uh, we have something that we can strengthen our hearts with and that we can be rooted and grounded in. And then we thank you for all the great wisdom and all of the great examples, dear Lord God, of, of other uh, bold people that were willing to stand up for the Word of God and they were willing to die for the Word of God. And we ask that everybody in this room, that they would make their minds up and that they would also just follow the same steps as Queen Esther did and so many others where they said, you know, if I perish... I perish. And we ask you just to be with us and also keep us safe in our everyday lives. And if we are the ones that go through that, dear Lord, we ask you that you would be with us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Song number 179. Song number 179.
Such Love, song number 179. That God should love a sinner such as I should learn to change my sorrow. Oh. 